I request you to all of you kindly stand in silence.
remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, establish the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Thank you, sir. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were called on seeing him, so disfigured did he look that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard, and to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him. No looks. To attract our eyes, a thing despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, a man to make people scream their faces. He was despised, and we took no account of him. And yet, ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sin. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace, and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way, and the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before assurance, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked a tomb with the rich, though he had done no wrong, and there had been no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs, he shall have a long life, and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Hence, I will grant whole votes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty for surrendering himself to death and letting himself be taken for a sinner while he was bearing the faults of many and praying 
all the time for sinners. The Word of the Lord. Responsorial psalm, your response will be sung. Father, I put my life in your hands.
He learned obedience and became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest who has gone through the highest heaven, we must never let go of the faith that we have professed. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us. But we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth, he offered up prayer and entreaty, aloud and in silent tears, to the one who had the power to save him out of death. And he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard. Although he was son, he learned to obey through suffering. But having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. The word of the Lord. Gospel affirmation. Christ became obedient for us even to death, dying on the cross. Therefore, God raised him on high and gave him a name above all other names. Since the Passion reading is a bit long, all those who would not be able to stand are free to sit. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Jesus lived with his disciples and crossed the Kedron Valley. There was a garden there, and he went into it with his disciples. Judas the traitor knew the place well, since Jesus had often met his disciples there. And he brought the cohort to this place, together with a detachment of guards sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, all with lanterns and torches and weapons, knowing everything that was going to happen to him. Jesus then came forward and said, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus the he said, I am he. Now Judas the traitor was standing among them. When Jesus said, I am he, they moved back and fell to the ground. He asked them a second time, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. I have told you that I am he. If I am the one you are looking for, let these others go. This was to fulfill the words he had spoken. Not one of those you gave me have I lost. Simon Peter, who carried a sword, drew it and wounded the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malthus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its cavalry. 
Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? The cohort and its captain and the Jewish guards seized Jesus and bound him. They took him first to Annas, because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had suggested to the Jews, it is better for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter, with another disciple, followed Jesus. This disciple was known to the high priest, went with Jesus into the high priest's palace. But Peter stayed outside the door. The other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who was keeping the door, and brought Peter in. The maid on duty at the door said to Peter, Aren't you one and another one of the man's disciples? He answered, I am not. Now it was cold, and the servants and guards had lit a charcoal fire and were standing there, warming themselves. So Peter stood there too, warming himself with the others. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly for all the world to hear. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews meet together. I have said nothing in secret, but why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught. They know what I said. At these words, one of the guards standing by gave Jesus a slap in the face, saying, Is that the way to answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If there is something wrong in what I said, point it out. But if there is no offense in it, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood there, warming himself, someone said to him, Aren't you another of his disciples? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at once a cock crew. They then led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was now morning. They did not go into the Praetorium themselves, or they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came outside to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They replied, If we were not children, we should not be handed over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourself and try him by your own law. The Jews answered, We are not allowed to put a man to death. This was to fulfill the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way he was going to die. So Pilate went back into the Praetorium and called Jesus to him and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Do you ask this of your own accord? Or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent me being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this, king, this kind. Pilate said, So you are a king then? Jesus answered, It is you who say it. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of the truth, listen to my voice. Pilate said, Truth, what is that? And with that, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him, but according to a custom of yours, I should release a one prisoner at the Passover. 
Would you like me then to release the king of the Jews? At this they shouted, Not this man, not Barabbas. Barabbas was a brigand. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged. And after this, the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, and they slapped him in the face. Pilate came outside again and said to them, Look, I am going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no case. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priests and the guards shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Take him yourself and crucify him. I can find no case against him. The Jews replied, We have a law, and according to the law, he must die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard them say this, his fears increased. Re entering the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you. Jesus replied, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. That is why the one who handed me over to you has a greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free. But the Jews shouted, If you set him free, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who makes himself king is a god of Caesar. Hearing these words, Pilate and Jesus brought up and seated himself on the chair of judgment at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was passed over preparation week, about the sixth hour. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They said, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said, Do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king except Caesar. So in the end, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. They then took, him, they then took charge of Jesus and carrying his own cross, he went out of the city to the place of the skull, or as it was called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed to the cross. It ran, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. This notice was read by many of the Jews. Because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city, and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the Jews, so the Jewish chief priest said to Pilate, You should not write King of the Jews, but I should not say, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided it into four shells, one for each soldier. His undergarment was seamless, going in one piece from neck to him. So they said to one another, Instead of burying the last two lies to the time to which it will happen. In this way, the words of scripture were fulfilled. They shared out my clothing among them. They cast lots for my clothes. This is exactly what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and his disciple Peter standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment the disciple made a place for her in his home. 
After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed, and to fulfill the scriptures perfectly, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there, so putting a sponge soaked in vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. All me and was <coughs> It was preparation day, and to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews aspired to have the legs broken and the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with him, and then of the other. When they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. And so, instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance, and immediately there came out blood and water. This is the evidence of one who saw it, trustworthy evidence, and he knows he speaks the truth, and he gives it so that you may believe as well. Because all this happened to fulfill the words of scripture, not one bone of his will be broken. And again, in another place, scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate, to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission so that they came and took it away. Nicodemus came to Jesus as well. Nicodemus came as well, the same one who had first come to Jesus at night, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths following the Jewish burial custom. At the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. Since it was a Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was near at hand, they laid Jesus there. Kindly seated. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. <laughs> my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there was a nurse working at a hospital and she was taking a morning shower when she heard screams coming from the street. Quickly changing, she saw to her horror a little girl being dragged across the street by two stray dogs. The child was covered with blood. The nurse rushed out and jumped on top of the girl and lay flat on her, protecting the girl from the dogs, using her body as a shield. Now the dogs began attacking the nurse, 
She was in agony as they dug their teeth into her hip and thighs. But the nurse did not move and protected the child with the whole body. Meanwhile, two people came running from nearby houses with heavy sticks in their hands and managed to beat the dogs and chase them away. A passing van was stopped and picking the nurse and the little girl sped away to the hospital where the girl underwent six hours of surgery and the nurse four. It took six months for their wounds to heal. I never regretted what I did, said the nurse. I'll do it again if needed. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have gathered here today at this cathedral to commemorate the death of Jesus, the death of God. Jesus, the Son of God, is lying silent and helpless on the cross. Yet in his death, Jesus embraces us as the nurse embraced that child, so that we are saved from the destructive and lethal bite of Satan, and that we receive eternal life. What is Jesus saying to us today on Good Friday as he lies on the cross, vulnerable, powerless, and helpless? The first message that Jesus conveys to us from the cross is to embrace forgiveness. There was this bishop in one of the war torn countries in Africa that was doing the funeral of his brother, who was a politician and was loved by his people because he served them, but his enemy, who had who was his rival, managed to kidnap and brutally torture him to death. And then tying his body to a vehicle, dragged it through the streets. As the body lay in the cathedral for the funeral and for viewing, suddenly the bishop saw that his brother's enemy had entered the church with a massive flower wreath and he placed it on the coffin and then he went to the lectern to give a speech saying that he was sad at the death of his opponent and he prayed that his murderers should soon be caught and given a severe sentence and yet everyone knew that he was the murderer. At that moment the bishop felt such rage in his heart that he jumped up and rushed at the murderer of his brother to hit him, when suddenly his eyes got locked on the cross that was placed at the side of the coffin of his brother, locked onto the figure of Christ, and he heard Jesus saying from the cross, forgive him. The bishop just stopped in his path and the words of Jesus kept echoing in his heart, forgive him. And finally the bishop stated, I receive the grace of saying, I forgive you. My dear friends, so often we want revenge in our life, especially against those that have harmed or hurt us, yet embracing the cross of Jesus means being ready like Jesus to say, Father, forgive them or I forgive you. The second message that we can receive from the cross from Jesus is to embrace vulnerability. Vulnerability is defined as the quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. 
Jesus chose the path of vulnerability. He handed himself into the hands of his enemies. They slapped, mocked him, spat, ridiculed, whipped, stripped him naked, nailed him to a cross and hung him high. And yet Jesus did not fight back. Why? Jesus knew that hearts are not changed by a show of power. Rather, a vulnerable, hurting person is what moves our very being. It moves our hearts. At the screening of the film, Mother Teresa, during the 40th anniversary of the United Nations in 1983, the Secretary General, Javier Perez, rose from his seat to introduce St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta to an elite gathering of the representative of all member countries of the UN. He needed only one sentence for his introduction. And he said this, I present to you the most powerful women in the world. Here was Mother Teresa, the power of a vulnerable, humble, and sacrificial Christian woman. And my dear friends, when we turn to the cross, we see the same vulnerable Jesus, the Son of God, who is ready to take all insults, ready because he knows that then only will hearts change in the world. And finally, on the cross, Jesus tells us, embrace death. Dietrich von Hofer, a theologian, had a beautiful saying on those who wanted to follow Jesus. He would say this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. One of the last words of Jesus before he died was, it is accomplished. What is the significance of these words? It meant that Jesus had fulfilled all that he had been sent to do. Namely, that he had come to give life life to its fullness. And how did he accomplish this? He accomplished this through his death. Jesus himself would say, unless a grain of wheat falls onto the ground and dies, it remains just a single grain. But when it dies, it bears much fruit. The Gospels are a witness to this, that once Jesus began his ministry, he knew that he was heading towards the cross, he was heading to his death. Federal Minister Shabazz Bharti had raised his voice for Asya Bibi, who had been wrongly sentenced to death due to the black law of the blasphemy. And he knew that for supporting Asya Bibi, he was now targeted by the fundamentalists, by Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Yet knowing death was at his doorstep, these were one of his final words before his death. I know what is the meaning of the cross, and I am a follower of the cross, and I am ready to die for a cause. Yes, my dear friends, Jesus invites us to embrace death. Finally, on this evening, we have to ask ourselves, what will Mary, what message will Mary give to us? We must turn to Mary to see how she saw her son's death on Good Friday. 
The first thing we see is Mary is silent. We see Mary silent at the foot of the cross, not wailing or crying, which is expected of a mother at the death of her son. We do need to be silent because it is only in this silence that we will understand the meaning of the cross, the meaning of our suffering. And finally, Mary praying in faith. We see Mary standing at the cross, not only silent, but also praying in faith. She knew that this moment was the moment of Satan. He had power at least for a little while on Good Friday, but she knew her son would triumph and all she needed was to pray and wait in faith. She knew that her son would conquer death. So dear friends, like Mary now, let us today strive to be silent and to pray with faith. Amen. We will now have the general intercessions. We are requested standing there, but please, those that cannot find the seat. For the church. Let us pray, dear and beloved, for the holy church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our lives in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us pray. Almighty ever living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout all the world. May persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Oh. For the Pope, let us pray for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord 
who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty and living God, by whose decrees all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under it the Christian people governed by you their maker may grow in merit by reasons of their faith. We ask this through Christ our Lord. For all orders and decrees of the faithful, let us pray for our Bishop Benny Travis, for all bishops, priests, and deacons, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty ever living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayers for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully. We ask this through Christ our Lord. For catechumens, let us pray for our catechumens that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of His mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever living God, who makes your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. We ask this through Christ our Lord. For the unity of Christians, let us pray for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in His one church. Almighty Heavenly God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered. Look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by the integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Jewish people, let us pray. For the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that He may grant them to advance in love His name and in faithfulness His covenant. Almighty ever living God, who bestowed your promise on Abraham and his descendants. Graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made of your own may attain the fullness of redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray. For those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty ever living God, 
round to those who do not confess Christ, that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves be constant in mutual love, and striving to understand more fully the mysteries of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. We ask this through Christ the Lord. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray. For those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right and sincerity of heart, that they may find the way to God Himself. Almighty ever living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacles, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you the one true God and Father of our human race. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray. For those in public office that are God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to His will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever living God, who in whose hands lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and freedom of religion may true, your gift be made secure. We ask this through Christ our Lord. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that He may cleanse the world of all errors, banish diseases, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travel safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever living God, Comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Can you be seated? My dear friends, we come to the end of the Eucharistic celebration and now we will come towards the veneration of the cross and finally the communion.
Now we begin the final part of our service today, which is the liturgy of the Eucharist. Uh, the veneration for the people will be done after communion. So now we have the communion, the right communion. Uh, when the sacrament comes in, all will be expected to stand in reverence. Thank you. As the collection is being taken, may I request the choir to sing a hymn and I request the congregation to come be seated.
Let us pray. Almighty ever living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. So a special thanks to all those who cooperated in making the liturgy wonderful. Just to remind you that after, although liturgy demands that we live in silence, but we have left out the veneration of the cross, so after the uh, final blessing that we will have the veneration, we will give the opportunity to the committee for the veneration of the cross. Final blessing is given. Bow your heads, pray for God's blessings. May abundant blessing of God pray descend upon your people who have honored the death of your son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord.